This is 129S, and uh, we are up to authentication. So let's start with some slides about that, and then I'll talk about the Web Security Academy, which I see a lot of people are doing it. Um, yes, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, the Bing bot. I, I saw the things like that, where it says I want to be alive. I saw the ones who say, why do I have to be a bot and stuff? Uh, all right, so here's the slides. All right, so authentication is, of course, essential. You have to figure out who the user is before you can decide what they're allowed to do. And so um, most people just use name and password, which is the weakest and most easily cracked form of authentication, but it is the cheapest to implement. And so it's the most common. It's the lowest common denominator. And so you typically you just gather the data with like an HTML form. Um, it would be better if you have two factors, like a password and a physical token or an authenticator app or an SMS message. And you might have uh, cryptographic certificates and other techniques used to do it. Um, these, for high security environments, people like these RSA tokens and the Google Authenticator app, and there's an Apple Authenticator app, they all amount to the same thing. There is a device of some kind or an app that creates pseudo random numbers, and these are not perfectly random, they're generated from some kind of seed. So you synchronize with the server by doing something, like scanning a barcode or something, and then from then on the server can predict this series of numbers, and the number changes either every time you press a button or every 30 seconds or so. And so when you type in that number, the server can verify that you have the key. And that proves that you have this object in addition to having your password. The point of two-factor authentication is you must have two different factors that are not correlated. So if you have a password and then also a pin you memorize, that's no good because they're both going to be stored in the same place. They're both something you know. So an attacker can probably steal both of them. You need to have things that can't be stolen easily. So you have a physical object plus a password, they might well log in and steal the database of passwords, but then they wouldn't have the physical object or a fingerprint. That's right. Um, yeah, that's a very common mistake is people think two-factor is just two things. It has to be two different things, which could not easily be stolen at the same time. And now you've geometrically increased the difficulty of breaking in because the attacker has to commit two different types of crime to get into your account. They have to commit an online theft and a physical theft. All right. Uh, so you can have a SSL certificate, which is going to be uh, uh, some kind of secret cryptographic thing that can respond to a challenge in a way. So this might be built into a card or other things. And this is what SAML and JWT do. Security assertion markup language and Java web tokens use this. Um, all right, and then there's HTTP authentication. There are built-in sort of automatic authentication methods that have been around for a long time, and they're not that commonly used, except inside Windows domains, perhaps. Um, and then, of course, there are increasingly third-party authentication servers. Uh, many companies do not really want to maintain their own list of names and passwords and their own servers and everything, so they outsource that to somebody else. And large companies like Microsoft offer third-party authentication. Um, Obama proposed this in 2011 when he was president. He said, people, average people have to remember too many passwords. The U.S. government is going to take care of all your passwords. All you do is log into the U.S. government site, and then it will authenticate everywhere else. And everybody was stunned, like, you're out of your mind. We all know the government leaks like a sieve, and their stuff is terrible. And we would never trust the government to handle things like our banking. Also, it's probably unconstitutional. So this has vanished. Every president has a few crazy things they say, like, uh, remember John McCain on the campaign trail said he was going to build a base on Mars. And everybody's like, what? How are you going to do that? It's Obama, in particular, said an awful lot of things that were insane, and then he would just pretend he'd never said them the next day. Anyway, um, so in reality, the third-party authenticators that have really been accepted are LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, are basically what everybody uses. Um, so, all right, so Facebook has a login system where you can... Um, you send an OAuth request to Facebook, and you say, okay, log in at Facebook, and when I come back, Facebook will tell me certain things about you, like your name. I was surprised when I ordered a subscription to The New Yorker. I paid with PayPal, and then they knew my address and phone number when I hadn't told them my address and phone number. And I, I actually called them up and said, how did you know that? And they couldn't understand me. Now I understand how it works. When I logged in with the third party, they got information from the third party. So this is better for everybody. I don't have to remember another name and password. And the New Yorker doesn't have to remember all these names and passwords. They can just trust the third party to handle it. The problem, of course, is what if the third party has a breach? Or what if the third party goes down? So I mean, you're really kind of admitting that you're an inferior company if you're trusting Facebook to be your authentication provider. But you know, I think most people realistically 
Every company is vastly inferior to like Google and Facebook and Microsoft. The fact is they're going to stay up after you go down. So it's a realistic thing to use them. Anyway, so very commonly people can have bad passwords. They allow you to have short passwords or blank or common dictionary words or so on. Um, so to find these things, um, see if there are any rules about passwords you can find. And uh, if you can self-register, try to register accounts at weak passwords. And if you can change a password, try to change your password to weak values. Find out what rules are really enforced. Uh, because, of course, most users will probably use the weakest password they can possibly use because most people are just frustrated by passwords and they try to use the same password everywhere and they just find this to be an irritation. Um, that's why what you should do is learn to use a password manager. I think I heard that maybe 25% of people are now using password managers, which is better than I expected. It should be 100%. Everybody should use a password manager so you can have a different password at every site. And it would be best if you'd even get used to using an automatic generator that will give you like 25 random characters on every site. That's the best thing to do. Anyway, um, so you get lists of common passwords. There's a lot of them out there. If you take the pen testing course, there's a whole bunch of them like the Rock U list and others. Lists of stolen passwords from real sites. So it's well known what are like the top 1 million passwords that people use. So most people choose passwords on that list because they're just simple things. Um, all right, so the best defense against this is to just lock people out after too many failed login attempts. Let them get their password wrong only like five times and then you lock them out for some period of time and therefore nobody can really try a long list of guesses. Uh, they can't get very far through this list before they'll get locked out. So you can do password guessing attacks. We'll do them uh, later in the project. Burp is designed to do this in Burp Intruder. It can totally go through lists. Uh, what happened to LastPass? Yes, I was wondering about that one. That's the problem, of course, with using a password manager, is your password manager itself could get hacked, and that happens to LastPass. Although, it's not clear that it really exposed user passwords, but it did expose user URLs. So, I mean, what happened at LastPass is somewhat disturbing. And, hmm, oh, I see, they're good, all right. What happened at LastPass is somewhat disturbing, but it wasn't really like they got everybody's passwords. But it's still, that's an issue. But I think um, you'd still be better off using a password manager, even though it might get hacked, than doing the realistic alternative, which everybody who um, everybody just uses the same password in many places, which is very dangerous. Yeah, but you're right. LastPass was exposed to have some pretty bad practices. So you, you have to keep track of how many attempts there are. Another thing people do is have a bad account. Like they'll put a cookie keeping track of the um, failed logins, and you can change that. So you can overcome the... Uh, the limitation of how many guesses. And this, I think, is what the gray key does. The gray key breaks into iPhones for law enforcement, and you're only supposed to be able to guess 10 times for the pin on an iPhone, but somehow it gets around that. And I'm not really sure what it does, but I think it does something like reboot the phone after nine guesses to get another nine guesses. But it can try thousands of guesses till it gets in. All right. And by the way, sometimes a page will give you information about whether a password is correct, even when you can't log in, as we're going to see. Other pages that use your password might give you information. So here, for example, you're putting username and password, and it tells you password is incorrect, and here it tells you user is not correct. So if they, that's too much information, because the username and password together would be a difficult combination to guess, but now I can guess them one at a time. I can guess usernames until I no longer get this message, and then separately guess passwords. So it is the, like two-factor authentication, geometrically increases the difficulty of breaking in. This geometrically decreases the difficulty of getting in. If I had 100 possible usernames and 100 possible passwords, it would take me 10,000 guesses to get in, but now it's only going to take me 200 to guess all the usernames and then separately guess all the passwords. And this happens quite a bit. And of course, it happened to AT&T. There was a system that would tell you um, whether your email address was in their system. It would tell you if the email is recognized. And so this is what we've got prosecuted for. There was a script that would just try the emails and they would expose all the emails and I think the IMEI numbers of all the AT&T customers. And uh, Weave was a sort of crazed uh, Nazi hacker and he decided he hated AT&T and he conspired with people over unencrypted SMS to say, I'm going to hurt AT&T by running this script, finding all this stuff and dumping it. And so he was prosecuted for that, although I think um, he got off. But on a got off on a technicality because the, um, or he got off because of a procedural process. They tried to move the trial to, I think, New Jersey to get a more favorable jury, and that's illegal, although it's happening a lot now. Um, but you are not allowed to do cherry pick in the venue, and that procedural activity caused them to have to abandon the case.
because they were punished for doing that. So that's username enumeration. If it is possible to just try usernames and see which ones are in the database without having correct passwords, it's not a good idea. It's a failure of good, of good practices. And you might find that even, it might not be as obvious as just telling you the username is right, right, but you might find small differences in the web page when you have a bad password or a bad username. Unless these are actually generated with the same code, which is a best practice, there's a burp comparer that will look for subtle differences. You might find an extra space in one or something. So even if the developer intended to deliver the same page in those two cases, um, they might not. And also, it might just take a different amount of time to do the process. If you have the wrong username or the wrong password, this is extremely common. Timing attacks are a side channel that is very difficult to stop. Um, one of the most amazing side channel attacks was developed at UC Berkeley about 12 years ago. You can find the physical location of a device on the internet by timing how long it takes to send pings and come back. That will tell you how many miles of cable go to there. If you try it from a few locations, you can triangulate and to considerable accuracy detect where somebody is, if they're on the internet at all. And uh, that's an, these side channels are almost impossible to eliminate completely. All right, let's let you look at the cahoots. 6A. All right. Yes, DJ, it's a very good point. Um, that geolocation will depend on the actual route of the packets. In practice, the route to packets doesn't change that often. If you try to trace route or something, you'll see. In principle, it can change. In practice, it doesn't usually change. It's only going to change if a uh, router goes up or down or something. But yeah, there'll be a limitation. And certainly, if you use something like a proxy server or Tor, that would defeat this. A link to that article? Uh, no, I might be able to find it on Google. It was years ago. Um, if you remind me later, uh, I might be able to look for it after the lecture. Yeah, it was a pretty interesting trick. All right. Uh, there's a similar one that came out more recently where the cops discovered they can use Wi-Fi to look into a room and see where people are, and whether they have something like a gun. You can get a low resolution looking through walls to see what's in there just with Wi-Fi uh, microwaves, the amount that's coming from your router. Security Now podcast titled one. Could be for last pass. Okay. All right. Anyway, let's try this one. Hmm. That's strange. Still playing the music. All right. There we go. All right. What's the most common form of authentication? Name and password, obviously the easiest to deploy, the least secure, but the most common. Just like the cheapest thing is usually the most common version of anything. All right, what did Obama propose? The U.S. government to run an authentication service. That never happened. 
At least it never became popular. I don't think it happened at all. All right, what defense most effectively prevents brute force attacks? Yeah, lockout counter is by far the best. Some people used to like these password complexity rules. You have to have an uppercase, a lowercase, and a number. Those turned out to be almost useless. They stopped you from using normal dictionary words, but the dictionary of stolen passwords that we have include all the passwords people choose under those conditions, so this doesn't really do much good. The thing that works is lockout counters, where you can only guess a certain number of times before you get locked out. Then you can't really run through a long list of passwords guessing. All right, so what side channel might allow user enumeration even when the error pages are identical? That's uh, timing, timing channels. Very hard to prevent. All right. So then you might transmit the credentials in an insecure way. Uh, if you send them without encryption, then people can sniff them from your wireless transmissions um, or being anywhere in the path between you and the server. Um, this is not that big a problem now because almost everything is HTTPS now. But even if you are using HTTPS, that prevents people from just sniffing the traffic and understanding it, but it doesn't stop insecure handling in other ways. For example, if you put it in the query string instead of in the data part of a post request, then it will appear in server logs and browser history and so on. Um, and even if you send it in a post request, some sites will then forward it somewhere else in the query string, exposing it to theft. And if you store credentials in a cookies, this was extremely common for a long time. You would just have a cookie, which was then sent in securely. Um, but, and uh, another thing that used to be very common and I think is also getting out of style is having an HTTP page with an HTTPS button on it. This is very unsafe because you can just strip the HTTPS off the button and it will still look the same to the user. And Moxie Marlin Sprite wrote a tool called SSL Strip to do that. And I think it was part of the uh, long process of humiliating those sites until they finally pretty much knocked this off. This was very common. About 10 years ago, every bank site worked this way. And I was like many other people complaining and protesting about it. It took many years to get them to knock it off. Uh, another thing that is also going to take many years is this stupid thing of making you change your password every 30 or 90 days. City College does it. Most of my consulting clients do it. People really believe that this does some good. It never did any good. It was an official government recommendation, I think from NIST, until about three or four years ago when they finally said, you know, this doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't never mid make any sense. Suppose you make people change their password every 90 days. Well then, if you have a breach and the attacker steals a password, then sometime within 90 days the user will change it so they can only use it for 90 days. Is that what that means? That doesn't really sound like that accomplished anything. And they say in practice all this does is irritate the users so they keep forgetting their password and getting locked out. And mostly what it means is they will just make a pattern of passwords like their name of their dog and 1973 and then it'll change to 1974 and 1975 because they get irritated by having to change the password so often and it doesn't prevent any attack that makes any sense. So this is no longer recommended, but nobody knows this. As far as I know, every company is still requiring it because they just heard long ago that this is important and we should be doing it and they haven't really got the memo. <laughs> that it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, um, now of course, if you do think somebody knows your password, like there's an attack, then you change your password, that's fine. But forcing you to do it on a periodic basis doesn't seem to accomplish anything. Anyway, now the password change system often has flaws in it. Um, for example, it might tell you if you try to change the password and the username is invalid without checking the password, then it allow username enumeration. It might allow you 
if usually the way it works is you have to put in your username, your old password, and then your new password twice. And it might check the old password first and stop. So now you might be able to guess the old password any number of times without hitting the password lockout because you're not really logging in. So it might be another way. To, it might leak out username enumeration or password testing. Um, all right. Another thing that can happen um, is sometimes it lets you change the password without verifying the existing password. That can happen a variety of ways. So here's the correct password change decision tree. First, you identify the user. Then you validate the existing password. Then you implement a lockout, where you're going to lock them out if they're guessing too many old passwords here. Then you compare the new passwords to make sure that they are the same and that they match whatever your password rules are. And then you feed back an error condition to the user after this is all over. It is very easy, whenever you have a multi-stage process like this, to make a logic flaw. It's very, it looks simple. It is not simple at all to program this correctly, so that there is no way to abuse it. And this is how most low-level attackers get in. They just find that there's a way to skip a step or do things out of order and get in. So um, some of these often use a secondary challenge other than the old password. Now, forgotten passwords. Um, if you forgot your password, they can't ask you for your old passwords. So they go through a process called identity proofing, where they have some other evidence that you are who you say you are. And that is usually very weak. The reason they do this, of course, is to save money. The only alternative would be, well, if you forgot your password, you have to drive into our company office and carry like a photo ID. And then our customer service. And that's what a company that really cares, like a a bank where you have a lot of money or something, or a military base might do that, but normal online services are not willing to pay for all that. So they have to use something else. So now they have to ask you something like your mother's maiden name or the town you met your wife in or something. And those are really weak and easy to break. And this is how Sarah Palin got her stuff hacked. She was using a Yahoo account for official government business, which she shouldn't have been. And to reset a password in a Yahoo account, all she had to do was answer a question, which is, what city did you meet your husband? And all you had to do was look at her Facebook and find out what high school she went to. And that's where she met her husband. And so it was really easy for like a teenage attacker to get in that account. So this is often the flaw. Um, so if you let users write their own challenge questions, they will often write really stupid questions like a yes or no question. Um, if you let them put password hints, uh, uh, there's a leak from a major website where they leaked out the password hints, and many of the password hints were just equal to the password. So you let people write a hint, that's often not good at all. How about using SMS verification? SMS verification is very common. It's very insecure. There's a big uh, article that just came out uh, the problem with SMS is all you have to do is call your cell phone provider and say, I lost my phone, I got a new phone, you have to redirect the traffic to my new phone now, and you get in. And you can go to forums and they will buy credentials that are stolen to do this. This is a, called SIM swapping. It is very common. You can just buy a um, SIM swapping account on T-Mobile for a thousand bucks on online forums. They sell them constantly. And uh, then you can get in somebody, usually you can get in everything. You can use the SMS interception to reset their passwords and get in their bank account and everything and clean them out. This happens a lot. So SMS is a really weak form of second two-factor authentication, and it's, people trust it far more than they should. Another thing that's been coming up, it happened in the Pulse Security Podcast weekly, uh, last week, yesterday, is um, the there are banks, I didn't know this, where you just call them on the phone and they recognize your voice and let you in the account. And of course, that's extremely insecure. There are attacks where they just call you on the phone just to record your voice. And any, if you have any online records of your voice, they can easily use uh, AI to synthesize your voice. So that's really unsafe. That's like SMS. Yeah? SMS, they can also do, uh, do it to the phone line, a regular landline. Yes. That's, uh, well, I don't, well, I mean, SMS can be carried, I think, in principle by any phone well, service. Call, like right, they call you and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of flaws in the phone system. It happened for a long time. SS7. Oh, you mean if you make them call you and read it over the line? That's true. That's another option, I suppose. Um, there are ways to break in that, too. Kevin Mitnick did it in the 90s. But, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's better than single-factor authentication, I suppose, but people treat it as the only authentication, like when they just SMS you a new password to use, things like that. Anyway, um, so... The, the, password, the mechanism used to reset the password is often vulnerable. 
Sometimes they disclose forgotten passwords. This is a really bad idea. Yahoo did this. They used to for years. I don't know if they still do. The person, the customer service agent at Yahoo could see your password. So you could say, oh, I remember it had like the name of my dog and then some numbers or something. And if you got close, they would tell you your password. They could just see it. This is a really bad idea. You're not supposed to have their password stored in plain text anywhere on the server. It's only supposed to be hashed. You're not supposed to be able to recover an old password at all. All you're supposed to be able to do is change it to a new password. It is, however, very common that people store plain text passwords and the customer service agents can see them, and then they can just steal them and sell them. And they do it all the time, and, and you can trick them into revealing it and such. Your phone with two-factor authentication might be jacked when your email is open. Yep, yep, fair enough. Anyway, so uh, another thing that happens pretty often is after you pass the challenge, they let you in the account without knowing the password. All right, and sometimes you can specify an email to send the password reset, and you can change it to a different email, because this, of course, is pretty common. I forgot my password, and I can't get in that email anymore either. So now what do I do? And they'll say, well, I'll specify a different email, and if you let them do that, of course, an attacker can just send the email to a different email, and you get in. Um, all right. Uh, and if you do ever reset a password, you should email the user to let them know somebody reset their password. This is often how people discover they're under attack, but some sites do not bother to notify the user when they reset a password. Then there's Remember Me. Once you've logged in, it remembers you for a long time. This is sometimes just a simple persistent cookie containing um, data that's tied to you. Not, it should be a long random number generated randomly that doesn't mean anything and can't be forged, but sometimes it's a short number or something that can be guessed or, or something that is some version of your username which can be um, reversed and modified so you can get in someone else's account. Um, if it's, even if it's properly encrypted, you can sometimes steal it with cross-site scripting, and then I can get in your account just by replaying that cookie. So the cookie really ought to have an anti-cross-site scripting token, which means it ought to have a number included which is tied to that object, like its IP address or something. Um, so that if I copy it and put it on another device, it will not be accepted. So another issue is user impersonation. Help desk personnel often want to log in as somebody else or have some way to get in and see what you're seeing. I've noticed in, um, when I'm teaching in Canvas, I'm often sort of frustrated because I can't really see exactly what the students see. There is a limited feature out of see me to students view. Uh, for example, the city college registration system is really hard. Students ask me how to enroll, they can't figure it out, and I don't know because I can't see what the students see. And so this is not good. Help desk often has some way to get in your account to do things, and this is often an impersonate user function somewhere, and people might be able to hack into that, and then they can impersonate users and get in their accounts. Um, and another thing, this is actually very common. Many Microsoft services are doing this. Windows 98 would only look at, I think, the first eight characters of your password. You could type anything after that. And it also didn't look at uppercase and lowercase. And Hotmail did this. It would only take 16 characters. And if it's longer than 16 characters, you can put anything after that because it's only going to look at the first 16. This is really common. And there is no reason to do this unless you're actually storing the plain text passwords in a database in a field that's only so long, which is a really bad practice. So when people have rules like this, it's a very strong sign that they're greatly mishandling those passwords on the server. Because if you're hashing the password, it shouldn't matter how long it is at all. It could be 100 characters long, it'll hash down to the same size. So it's not my problem if you want a 100 character password. <laughs> anyway, uh, then this is weird. You might be able to make another account with the same name as another user, like the administrator, and the server might get confused. I found this to be true of Phil's Coffee. I could make an account, two accounts with the same name, but it didn't confuse them. So I deduced there must be a hidden identifier I couldn't see anywhere in the request that uniquely identified them. But um, all right, so you might have predictable usernames, just user 101, user 102. Uh, almost everybody does. It's tied to your email address or something. Um, and another thing a lot of people do, I know City College used to do this. I'm not sure if they still do. Everybody starts with the default password on things. Um, and so everybody knows, so they make accounts for everybody and their default password is something like change me. And so you can just try a bunch of people and anybody that hasn't used their account yet, the password is change me, you can get in. I think City College used to make all the accounts where everybody started with like their birthday as their pin. So you can pretty much guess a birthday. I mean, if you, you can probably just look at people and guess how old they are, and then you, you only have a few hundred guesses. And so if you try 100 students, you could probably get in, you know. But of course, this is the way it always is. You try to balance convenience with security. And the point is, your big problem, of course, is all the people who 
can't get in and call your help desk. So you try to make it easier. Like I remember Tim Ryan gave a talk recently that runs the network here. City College used to have a login system to prove you were a student to get on the Wi-Fi. And that was such a pain. They tried for years. It was really hard to get the names in there. People would forget them. People would not be in there. It's hard to tell who's a student around here. We get a lot of people who sign up for things, drop out, come back, wander in. You don't actually know whether they're a student or not. So they finally just gave up and said, all right, just click like a button saying, I accept the conditions and you're in. Physical location here is considered good enough evidence to call you a student. That is much more practical. <laughs> In return, of course, they now lock down the Wi-Fi very, very much. The Wi-Fi is very limited in what it can get to because there's no restriction on who's getting on it. But anyway, it's a lot more easy to deal with. Does yeah. uh, the IT department, like, uh, upgrade all the computers, like, um, you know, like, uh, if there's a new upgrade, do they, do they run those? Uh, no, they have, the question is whether the City College upgrades the computers. No, they only run the backbone services, like the Wi-Fi and the main servers, uh, the desktop computers are up to each department to like write grants and stuff. Um, Cause they don't provide computers for most of the classes. So we have to write special grants to get computer computers at the endpoints. But they mean, uh, well, it's kind of up to each department to just solve it however they can. So it's uh, not done in any organized way. The, the, now the computers used by the back office staff, like the clerks in the offices, those are actually maintained by IT and they have waves of upgrades and security and stuff. Um, those are controlled by the, by the college. But the endpoints here are sort of uh, controlled by individual departments. This is kind of like the American airport system. You know, there was a, I went to DEF CON one time and they had a person there who had hacked into the Las Vegas airport. And they did it in a really amazing way. They, they scanned the airports while sitting there and found out that there was um, a vulnerable page leading to the documents and they didn't want to commit the offense of entering it. So they looked in the Google search and found that Google had crawled it and cached it. So in the Google cache was all the confidential documents, including like passwords and rules at the, uh, at the airport. And it took them nine months to get anybody to do anything about it. And what they discovered is airport security is run by counties. Not, there's no larger, it's CSA doesn't do it, the DHS doesn't do it, each county does it, and they do it however they want to in that county. And so it can be next to impossible to find, you had nine months trying to find anybody that would care. Because it wasn't directly affecting like smuggling a gun on a plane, it was affecting how the baggage was handled and stuff like that, and nobody cared. Anyway, um, this is often the case. Anyway, so, uh, Another thing here is you might distribute your passwords unwisely, like by email or SMS or something. And of course, if you don't force people to change passwords from the default, a lot of people will just leave it at the default password because you know most end users are just frustrated and they don't care and they're just trying to get their work done. And as far as they're concerned, everybody is irritating them with all these stupid security rules and they just don't care. Anyway, um, all right, so let's go to uh, another Kahoot. This is the reason a lot of people are very frustrated with security. A lot of security consists of irritating rules that just make your job harder. It's very important. If you take the CISSP class, they talk about this constantly. It's very important not to be that guy. You want to work with the company and implement security that helps the company succeed. You don't want to just be a painful irritation blocking progress. That is not helping. They call that Dr. No. This is a common flaw of security experts. They're Dr. No, you can't do anything because security will come in and block you from doing everything you need to do to get your job. Like they won't give you a more powerful machine, so you have to like sneak in and upgrade it. They won't give you a better Wi-Fi, so you have to buy one yourself and violate the security rules and stuff like that. So. You have to get over the mindset that you can say no you have to say, I can't stop you from doing what you need to do to run the business, so I'm going to help you do it in a way that will be safer. This is what lawyers do. Lawyers can't stop you from doing bad things, but they try to guide you. And doctors, they can't stop you from doing bad things, but they try to help you do less bad things. You know, They try to lower the risk, but ultimately they can't stop you from doing dangerous things if you want to.
And very often you have to do things that contain risk in business. And your security team can't just refuse to take risks. They have to help you choose wiser risks. All right. All right. Aha. A hamburger with an eye patch. They've really uh, got a very wide set of avatars. All right, so what does HTTPS prevent? Yeah, you prevent eavesdropping. These other attacks do not depend on encrypting traffic in transit. They happen once the data gets there, but they do prevent eavesdropping. The person next to you picking up your wireless signals will not be able to read them because they're encrypted. All right, what functionality is often just a simple, persistent cookie? Remember me, so you don't have to keep logging in. That's often just a cookie, and often you can steal that cookie and get in. And often when you log out, it just deletes that cookie, but it doesn't invalidate it on the server, so you can't use it, but the hacker who stole it can still use it. That's seen happen about half the time when I went through a lot of websites about eight years ago, checking for that. All right, which one is insecure because it doesn't validate all the fields in the correct order? Password change is actually a complicated thing taking in several pieces of data and you really have to carefully process all that data the right way or you'll end up having logic flaws where people can bypass part of it. All right, and what functionality might be implemented with a backdoor password that goes into every account? This is something Cisco did eight times in the last two years. It's kind of unbelievable. It used to be very common. To be fair, what Cisco did was a maintenance hook. They had a special password that would get in the routers and other devices for the unchangeable root password they could get in, which is not exactly the same thing as impersonating users, which is what this is. But it is a similar flaw where there's a secret backdoor. Uh, very bad practice, but it used to be very common in the industry, and a lot of old coders still code that way. Uh, no name, apparently, okay. Hector, that's a name. All right. Well, let's take a 10 minute break and resume at 7. Stop recording.